I'm Bob Browner. I'm going to give a little talk today about where it starts and where it ends end up, maybe two different places, but we're going to talk about the uh, uh, architecture uh, of a Hawking rifle from a builder's standpoint. Um, I'll go over the architecture real quick, and if anybody has any questions at any time, please ask them, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Um, a Hawking rifle, or, or, or half-stock rifle, are actually a pretty complicated half-stock rifle. They're, they're uh, definitely not simple. Uh, the, the aspects that make them so so complicated is first of all the barrel everything's tapered or long or whatever the barrels are tapered from muzzle or from a breech to muzzle and the uh the lock panels the lock panels taper the opposite direction they're wider in the front narrower in the back so you got the barrel going this way and the lock panels going this way and you you have to fit the lock plate in that transition, it has to kind of go in between the two the two planes, and then when you do that, then you have to to make it uh, fit so that you can get the breech. The barrels pop out of these things for to facilitate the planing, and then there, there's a pretty complicated area right in, in the middle of the gun. Um, another aspect of the uh, architecture of the original guns that we have a a very very subtle S-shaped uh, profile down the side of the stock, like it'll come off the, uh, if you look at it from the side, it'll start at the top of the lock panels, come down through the wrist to the middle of the butt, and then curve up to the corner up here. The other side does the same thing, but the cheek piece covers it up, and if you, you don't look at them, they, they, will have, they will have that definite S-shape to it. Another aspect, when, when somebody hands me a, a rifle that they've done and want me to critique it or help them or whatever, two things I look at. The first, the first being on the bottom of the stock, they're flat and then it comes, chain transitions to round. They're round up here, flat here. And they make that transition right at the back of the back trigger. You can see a, you can see a, a, a transition there. Another aspect of, on the other side, they uh, they will have this will be rounded, and you will and flat here where they transition together. You'll wind up with a, a flat, almost like a fingernail type shape, right at the top back of the breech. Uh, another misconception about Hawking rifles that they have bellies. They have they have no bellies. The, the, the bottom profile of the stock, you have a straight line here basically a straight line here through the wrist and then a straight straight surface from the, uh, the, the the back of the wrist to the toe. They, they give the uh, perception of, of a belly because the, 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 if you think of it as an actual bend, the guns come down straight and then they bend to conform to this other surface and people look at that and think that's a belly which really not. They also never say never about any of this stuff, but it's pretty close to say never that <laughs> they never have a belly in the forearm. If anything, it can go concave, but never, never, uh, never swells out. Um, I'm off the top of my head just trying to think of anything else I can think of. Uh, Architecture-wise, uh, you just, I get my hands on it. I, on as many original guns as I as I can, and I, I look at them, photograph, measure them. I roll them around my hands and feel them. I get as much out of feeling when I'm looking at them. It seems like, and they just it, it helps you figure out how to blend all this stuff together. Um, there's another misconception about the rifles that they're bulky. They're they're not bulky. This is. Uh, well, this is a, a copy of an original gun that I have, and you're welcome to take a look at it and handle it, whatever you want to do. But there, there is no extra wood anywhere on these things. Um, as far as the building goes, the building of the guns, the, probably the biggest tip I can give anybody that's going to tackle one of these things 
is once you get the, the, the breach fit together, the two pieces where they where they fit together properly, I epoxy those together and then let them as a unit with the barrel. It makes makes things a much easier. Um, other than that, that's a not off the top of my head anything that I can really think of. But the Roger taper, I generally for a 50 or 54 caliber gun, I use half inch rod. And they're basically a half inch through here, and then they drill the hole 7 16 through the stock. So I taper the, taper the rod to, to accommodate that. Anybody got any questions about it? As far as the locks, 
the detergers. I think my, and this is just my opinion, there's none of this stuff has ever been written down or etched in stone. And you, people, you have to look at, look at the gun, think about it, come to your own conclusions, basically. And you do that through the study of the many original guns as you can. My opinion is they probably made a lot of the triggers themselves and some of the locks. Uh, they'll use uh, commercial locks. You'll see Elbows and Goldshires and several different brands of, of commercial made locks on them. Then you also see some that have nothing on them. My original gun, I believe, they, uh, they uh, made the lock, built a lock in shop. There's no markings on it. You can see the uh, on the inside of the plate, a lot of parts, you see all the file marks and everything indicative of they made this this thing one piece at a time. Um, I think they used uh, the early guns were mostly sheet metal parts. Uh, they formed the butt plates in two pieces, put a rivet to hold the two pieces together, and then forged brazen the joint. The way they did that, you see on on original uh, two-piece butt plate guns, <coughs> on the inside of the joint, you can look and see scrap brass pieces, little chunks of brass, little, little just pieces of brass that didn't completely melt in the forge when they were brazing it together. On a lot of the later, the, the cast spark guns, the, the butt plate, you can look inside there and you can see it's obvious that they took a two-piece plate and made a mold from that to do their cast marks because on the inside, a lot of times you can see what would have been the chunks of brass and the other chunks of brass in that joint. Uh, they, had to have, they had to have made that, that mold from one of their homemade plates. Uh, the nose caps were two pieces early, the, the, the outside body part, and they put that on, on a flat piece, so there's a joint on the out, you can see a lot of times a joint on the outside of the nose cap from when they brace it together. Later guns are, are cast parts. You see a lot of times on the original guns you'll see mixed parts on, on guns where they'll have uh, maybe a cast butt plate maybe a sheet metal nose, nose cap and entry pipe. I think, I, my opinion is that they had the ability to make any part they needed. If they were out of one place one day and they needed one, they fired up the forge and made one. They were, they were in the business to make money. You know, you gotta, you gotta remember that. They weren't, they weren't there, they had no idea that 200 years later, they were gonna be interested in this stuff, so they didn't. They didn't worry about taking you know, anything down in, in record. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Come up with questions. <laughs> what are the most desirable ones now that collectors are looking for? What time period? Everybody wants the early stuff. The earlier the better, just like antiques, just like cars and anything. The number one, and this is my opinion again, the number one most desirable hawk and rifle is right up here on top of that hill. There's a gun there, silver mounted owned by a steamboat captain <coughs> from St. Louis. He had a fleet of steamboats. And who knows the origin of the gun? Who had it, whether he ordered or someone had it? the gun for it, but it is, it's just magnificent rifle, it's all silver mounted and great. It's, it has a 1830 date on it, which you see, you, you hear about these things that, that are dated. Bullshit. The only one that's really honestly got the true date on it is the one on top of the hill, that's 1830. Um, that's just a, it's a great gun. There, you, you, if you haven't been at the top of the hill over there, you need to go. They're not gonna. There's a dis display up there. But you will probably never see it again in one place. There's some just some fantastic, fantastic guns in that display. That's. Footlock. What a footlock. That's.
That's a big question. I get that. I ask, get that asked that quite often. Um, I've had probably a hundred of the original guns in my hands, and I have seen one that was originally and still is never been converted to flat lock. It's it, well, it's the earliest gun known, and it. Uh, it doesn't look like we think a St. Louis Hawkins should look. You have to remember that their father was Christian Hawkins, who was a fantastic Kentucky rifle builder in Maryland. And the brothers wound up in St. Sam and Jake, two of the brothers, wound up in, in St. Louis building these things. And it, it um, is what I say, it's never been converted. The barrel stamp that only says Hawkins on top, which some people don't believe, but it, believe me, it's, it's honest, it's correct. And it, uh, full stock gun, the architecture is quite a bit different. It doesn't look like, like we think a St. Louis Hawkins should look, but it's, it's, un, it's unquestionably real. Um, they, we know they built the box, but where are they? You know, there's no, that's the only original one that I have ever, you know, had, had the opportunity to see. You have people asking about the, you know, the half stocks and even full stock guns on these later patterns, and I just, I, I don't do them. I, I don't feel they're, I don't feel that they're correct. So I don't. I try and keep my stuff as authentic as possible. Um, finish on the guns. I think the, uh, I've seen a handful of original guns that were in good enough condition that you could say, yeah, the, the stocks were varnished. The barrels, I'm not going to say always, but the, the majority of them were glued, rust glued. And it's like an old colder Winchester, eventually they turn brown. That's why they're brown now, not a lot of the guns. But I believe that most of them were probably rust glued. Uh, the, uh, the lock, butt plate, uh, trigger guard, nose cap, all that were case hardened, and, uh, which is, you know, faded away, but I've seen, seen enough high condition guns that you can draw some conclusions anyway. No, I can't think of any. Anybody got any? Well, <laughs> I guess we're done. <laughs> so the other part of my question is, what part of the country are you most likely to be found in I'm sorry? What part of the country are most likely to be found in where would you be? Now they've, they've, there's been such an interest in this stuff for, they've been highly collectible for many years now and so they, they change hands and they, they move all over the country. There's really no set place to look one. There aren't many in the weeds anymore. Um, out in the you know, rural areas, possibly family guns. I saw a gun, uh, the gentleman and his father were here on Friday and Saturday. They have an original JNS rifle that had been in the family since the 1830s. So you, there are, they are still out there. I, I have found uh, four original uh, squirrel rifles, so the smaller guns, which nothing was ever written about those, very little, very few photos of them, so people don't realize what they're looking at. And I've been fortunate enough to, you know, to find a couple of those. Um, there are some out there, but they're still there. Far and few in between. They, they, uh, well, a friend of mine bought one that came out of Europe, and somehow it, it went back to, to France. He, he was able to, years ago, bring the gun back here. So they've, it, it's hard to say where you can go to look for one now, other than you know, the auction houses and stuff like that. If I were to look for a gun, I would have no idea where to start yeah, as far as finding one. There, there, there's been enough written and, and there, 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 enough written about them and they're publicizing them and people, if they see it says Hawking on it, and, you know, they, they, they get an idea and that creates problems too because there are a lot of fakes. You know, that's, you know, probably, I've seen, I don't know how many fakes, but many of them. There are a lot of people trying to fake this stuff up. A friend of mine had a gun that he was interested in buying. 
he had pictures of it, showed me the pictures. And we found out, I found out later who the guy is that's doing this stuff, but he takes a gun, he beats it up, spray paints it to give it patina, and sells them. You know, sells these things, got the nerve to do that. Okay. A friend of mine showed me this picture of this, of this gun, and I'm looking at the picture, and the gun's got, you know, the, the dark and light spots like a old gun should have. And it's got the guy's hand on, on the butt stock of the gun holding it for the picture. And his thumb and fingers were the same color as the gun. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you have to, if somebody's interested, if, if you're looking for a real gun, get help. Get help, don't just uh, take for granted it. It is what it's reported to be. It's a very good chance that it's not. That there's anything, it's like anything else, that there's money about or there are people trying to get it. Anybody got any, anything else? Okay, I guess we'll... <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much.